Hello and good evening once again. Today is the seventh lecture in the lecture series 2022. You all know that I'm Murli Dharpai, currently working as Dean in Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences. Today's topic is on the request of Dr. Suma from KMC Manipal. She wanted me to talk on ovarian malignancies. It's a huge topic. It's very big. So I thought, let me give one by one. Today, I'm going to talk on ovarian germ cell tumors, diagnosis and management. When I was a PG, there was a question for 35 marks, right on histogenesis of ovarian malignancy. What does it mean? That simply means what is the origin of different cancers in ovary? It's very simple to remember that. Think of the cells in the ovary and those many cancers only are possible. Accordingly, the most common is surface epithelium and the malignancy arising from that will be epithelial tumors, the commonest ones. And again, subclassification of that is also very easy to remember. Think of the epithelial cells in and around ovary. What are they? The closest one is from the tubal epithelia, that is serosal epithelia, so serous cell carcinoma. If it takes the cervical epithelium, it will be mucinous carcinoma. If it is endometrial variety, then it will be endometroid. Bladder type epithelium, it will be transitional cell tumors. And if it takes slightly around kidneys, clear cell tumors. And then there will be mixed variety. In each one of them, there will be benign, borderline, and malignant varieties. Then comes sex cord stroma. What are the cells there? Granulosa cells. So you will have granulosa cell tumors, theca cells, theca cell tumors, fibrous tissue in and around connective tissue, you will have fibromas, Sertoli cell and Leydig cells, and finally steroid producing cells. So steroid type of tumors. Now, I used to ask this question to undergraduates, which is the germ cell in the ovary? And no one would answer. They would consider it like a million dollar question. Obviously it is ovum. So germ cell is nothing but the ohm. And when the ohm decides to become malignant, my teachers used to teach me in a simple way. If it takes the line of becoming the embryo, so you will have called embryonal type of cancers. Embryonal cell cancer being the, the most virulent one. And then you can have other cancers in that direction. If it decides to go extra embryonal type, not differentiating itself into embryonal cells, then you can have different dysgerminomas, teratomas, and other things. So this germinoma, yolk sac tumors, embryonal cell carcinomas, teratomas, and chorea carcinoma. Currently, it is not classified as we were remembering it, that is embryonal side and extra embryonal side. Now WHO classification says, number one is primitive germ cell tumors. That means they are not differentiated themselves into any type of cells, specialized cells, like ectoderm, endoderm, or mesoderm. So the number one is this germinoma. Then comes yolk sac tumor. Then we have embryonal carcinoma, which is the most virulent variety. Polyembryomas, non-gestational chorea carcinoma. Again here, it's going up to the villi stage, but not beyond that. Mixed germ cell tumors with specific components, you have to specify them, diffuse embryoma variant, an example. Then we have biphasic or triphasic teratomas. That means two types of cells or three types of cells. The germ cell differentiates into. First one is immature. Obviously, it is an attempt to become mature, but it's not really differentiated. Then we have mature variety which will have either a solid 
or a cystic tumor. Cystic is the commonest that we know, dermoid cyst, where all the three cell lines, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm can be seen. The third main category is monodermal teratomas and somatic type tumors. That means here, one cell line only is differentiated. You may have thyroid group of cells or carcinoid group of cells or CNS tumor group or carcinoma group. Now it's such a huge classification, not very difficult to remember. First think of primitive germ cells where it is not differentiated into any mature type like ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. So you will think of this germinomas, yolk sacs, abdominal cell carcinoma, and chorea carcinoma mainly. And when it goes into mature variety, but biphasic or triphasic, it will be immature or mature. Mature would be solid and cystic, or it could be monodermal teratomas. Very easy to remember this. Now, I am not going to talk on all of them. I'm going to talk on most common and most important ones, which can come as a big question in the exam or can come as a short note in the exam. This germinoma is definitely one of the commonest malignancies that we see and also an important question. Yolk sac tumor is the next one. Also, we can talk about immature. And finally, I will talk about cystic, that is dermoid cyst. So primitive germ cell tumors are the neoplasms in simple or early form. They show little evolution, as I have already explained, and they differ from teratomas in a way that when you say teratomas, they're composed of variety of tissues, as I told you, ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm, usually derived from two or more germ cell layers, same thing exhibit a higher degree of somatic differentiation. They can go into thyroid stroma ovary, for example. So having differentiated between the teratomas and dysteromonomas, now let's go into details about each of these four important cancers. That is, one is dysteromonoma. This has got a male version also, and that is testicular seminoma. Epidemiologically, they are the most common malignant germ cell tumor. That's why I'm talking in detail about them. 30% of all germ cell tumors. So one third of the big chunk. So I'm talking about four of them. In fact, this is slightly more than one fourth, one third of them. They are found in both sexes. I just now was telling the male counterpart is testicular seminoma primarily affects girls and young women. Again, when I used to ask a question to PGs, why do you think germ cell tumors are common in younger age group? They used to again wonder why. It's very simple and straightforward. When will you see the germ cells, that is the ohm, it's only the reproductive age group, isn't it? So that's why it is common in girls and young women. They are often bilateral, of course, because both the ovaries will have the OVA. They are highly sensitive to chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy, but we usually nowadays don't give radiotherapy. I will talk about this a little later. What are the risk factors? Obviously, this genetic gonads. If it's a normal gonad, most of the time, they won't have any problems. But it is this genetic gonads, they will not only give rise to infertility, even if they don't turn malignant, but these are the gonads which are more prone to become malignant. Risk is increased in dysgenesis with Y chromosome. Suppose there is a Y chromosome, then the risk factor increases. Pure gonadal dysgenesis, that is 46XY or bilateral streak gonads can have this or mixed gonadal dysgenesis, that is 45X, that is Turner's we know, and 46XY, plus unilateral streak gonads also can have this, or contralateral testis, so over testis what we say sometimes. Androgen insensitivity syndrome, this is most notorious, testicular feminization syndrome, what we used to say, that's exactly why gonadectomy at pubertal age group is advised, 
the chance of them turning malignant is very, very high. Gonadoblastomas, ovarian tumors composed of germ cells plus sex cord stroma, together called gonadoblastomas. If left in situ, 50% chance of developing malignancy. So now let's come to the gross pathology of this germinoma. They are the big tumors. And as you can see, on clinical examination, it can be easily mistaken for fibroids because number one, they are big and they are sort of solid and they are firm and bosselated as you can see here. So only thing is your sense of the patient is very young, so you don't expect fibroids in them and other features, that is other clinical signs, wherein you cannot make out the lower border in fibroids. Here you can, it has come when it becomes so big with a big uh, stalk there or a, a ovarian, um, what do you call ligaments, it will come into the abdomen. Gross pathology is important for us at the time of laparotomy or surgery. They can become huge, five to 15 centimeters, solid, as I said, capsulated, somewhat like fibroids, and bosselated, again, like fibroids. They are firm. Again, firm is fibroid, rubbery. That's how it differentiates from fibroids. Cut surface is fleshy, again, like fibroids, but you won't see those world appearance. Pale, tan to gray brown. Presence of calcification, again in fibroids, there can be cal calcification, suggestive of gonadoblastomas. So in this, if there is calcification, it suggests gonadoblastomas. So it is a young patient who may have bilateral tumors, or even if it is unilateral, it is in one of the flanks, unlike fibroids, which you are usually in the center, and the patient is usually in the mid reproductive age group, whereas here it is younger girls. Histology is actually, we don't need to know much, but uh, these are very typical features, so it's easy to remember again. Difficult to confuse with other neoplasms. They are large, round, ovoid, or polygonal cells. Abundant, clear, and very pale cytoplasm. Large, irregular nuclei, prominent nucleolis. Cells in lobules separated by fibrous septa, as you can see a nice fibrous septa. And septa often infiltrated with lymphocytes. There are small lymphocytes that you can see. Plasma cells and granulomas. What are the clinical features? This is very important for us. Rapidly growing tumor. You remember these germinomas can suddenly become big size in no time. So within six months, the patient complains, I am noticing a big mass. That's the typical history. They are asymptomatic in 25% of the cases, but the usual symptom is pressure symptoms because of the big mass. Acute abdomen can occur, maybe because of ascites or hemorrhage or necrosis. They very rarely twist, unlike the dermoid cysts, because they are heavy. Menstrual irregularities can occur if there is a component of granulosa cells, granuloblastomas, so to say. And there can be weight loss because a lot of energy, a lot of this one is uh, taken by the growth of the tumor. What are the tumor markers? This is an important issue. You have to remember this very, very clearly. And what is that? You will get placental alkaline phosphatase. Remember, these germ cells are growing haphazardly at the primitive stage, but they are not becoming uh, not reaching the stage of a fetus. So you may get up to placental alkaline phosphatase, or you can get LDH, one and two. Up to 95% of the cases, these are the two important markers, placental alkaline phosphatase and lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. HCG can be there again because they can differentiate themselves into something like chorionis villi due to intermingled syncytiotrophoblasts in 5% of the cases. But what is most important for you to remember for life is that AFP is not a marker as there is no embryonic differentiation. This is what I am trying to impress upon all of you. These are very primitive cells. They are not differentiating up to the embryonic level. 
maybe up to they can go up to villi or something like that so alpha feto protein feto there is no fetus here so remember don't answer alpha feto protein as a tumor marker for this germinoma i hope i'm very clear i don't know how else to say this i'll repeat maybe one more time afp is not a marker as there is no embryonic differentiation ultrasonically obviously they are large and solid bilateral sometimes and lobulated adnexal mass with irregular internal echogenicity highly vascularized and low resistance on doppler staging is like any other ovarian malignancy uh, we still go with the figo 2014 staging the stage 1 is tumor confined to ovaries it's a general formula but here when you say 1a one ovary capsule is intact b is both the ovaries b for both remember that way c is one or both ovaries but important here is c is spill c is spill remember that way surgical spill but when you say c1 c2 was a natural spill before you open the capsule had ruptured and c3 there is ascites already very easy to remember stage 2 tumor involves one or both ovaries all right with pelvic extension so nearby extension yesterday i was talking about gestational trophoblastic neoplasia one is uterus second is going into the pelvis in and around below the pelvic brim within the pelvis or primary peritoneal cancer a is extension and or or implant on uterus and fallopian tubes b is other pelvic peritoneal tissues right so no metastasis so far so m0 if you go by tnm classification t1 maybe but m0 no lymph node set so n0 also whereas it is stage 3 tumor involves one or both ovaries that's okay but peritoneum outside the pelvis that is remember and there is lymph node involvement when you say a right but it is retroperitoneal then of course you have only microscopic metastasis when you say a a is further divided to a1 and a2 i will not go into the details but when you say b it is macroscopic somewhat like in cancer cervix we say a is microscopic b is macroscopic stage 1a and 1b and c of course it is less than 2 cm when you say c it is more than 2 cm even though it is macroscopic stage 4 is obviously distant metastasis excluding peritoneal uh, metastasis and pleural effusion is a and the rest of it hepatic and all is b stage related facts 60% of tumors are stage 1 at diagnosis thankfully 90% are confined to one ovary so not only stage 1 it is stage 1a so again we are fortunate that we can save another ovary because we are dealing with a young girl maybe more she is unmarried also she wants to get married and she wants to have children spread of course lymphatic it can be blood and direct spread all all the three long standing or recurrent that can be metastasis to metastasis to lung liver and brain late manifestation metastasis metastasis to mediastinum or supraclavicular lymph nodes these are the late manifestations what's the treatment yes they are chemo sensitive i told you that but then would you like to keep that big mass and then give so many kgs of chemotherapy no in general any ovarian malignancy the primary treatment is surgery after all any malignancy there are three types of treatment one is surgery chemotherapy and radiotherapy now i promised you to talk about radiotherapy a little later let me finish it off right now why radiotherapy is not popular in ovarian cancer just think for a minute if you have to irradiate you have to irradiate the abdomen and there are very vital structures in the abdomen what are they at least two of them one is liver other one is kidney they cannot tolerate more than 2000 rats they are destroyed and we are destroyed if you destroy that whereas the uterus is comfortably sitting in the pelvis and it can take up to 8 1000 rats 
uterus is the only organ in the body which can take so much, very close to lethal dose of radiation. What is the lethal dose of radiation? 10,000 rats. And the uterus can take 8,000 rats, both through intra uh, cavity as well as external radiotherapy. Whereas abdominal irradiation is very, very difficult and dangerous. There was a technique called moving stick technique. I beautifully explained it in my uh, MS paper or MD paper, but then that also not given. So it is mainly surgery and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is very, very good for ovarian malignancy, but then surgery is first because that way, when you remove the big bulk of the ovarian tumor, the amount of chemotherapy that is to be given will be very less. So obviously, in early stage and in young, you would go for surgery. But because she is young, and as I told in the previous slide, 90% of them are single ovary, 1A. So unilateral ovaryotomy is all that is required. And remember, I told you in the earlier staging time that it is M0 and L0. So there is no need to do a very elaborate operation at all when it is stage 1A. Just remove the ovary. It has not even gone to the uterus. It has not gone to the any other structures. Right? Maybe you can remove ipsilateral tubes. That doesn't matter. As long as there's another tube on the other side, contralateral tube and contralateral ovary. Uterus is needed, of course, for her fertility. So metastatic tumor in a young, you may still do unilateral ovaryotomy only to save the other ovary, and but you consider chemotherapy for her. Nowadays, we have oncofertility. Uh, fertility. We can save the eggs and we can even save the bit of ovary. That's another matter. Metastatic but advanced disease in women who have completed the family, completed the family. Then, yes, go ahead and do THBSO. And of course, you give chemotherapy because as I told you, chemotherapy is best for ovarian tumors. Early with gross metastasis, elderly with gross metastasis and recurrence, these are the select few who you may consider radiotherapy. But again, radiotherapy is very difficult. As I said, moving strip, strip technique is the radiotherapy. That means each day you will, you will divide the abdomen into several strips and each day you irradiate only 200 and next day you uh, irradiate two strips, 400. And then when you reach 2000, you keep on reducing one, one strip from below. So at a given time, you are only giving 200. That's called moving strip technique radiotherapy, but it is rarely used. Surgery in special situations, girls with Y chromosome, testicular feminization syndrome, also bilateral oophorectomy, no other choice. Bulky disease, you may do cytoreductive surgery and omentectomy also, and of course, chemotherapy is required later. Suspicion of mass in contralateral ovary, resection of mass, even if she's young. You may retain a little bit of ovary, but if there's a mass, you just resect that particular mass. Unilateral pelvic lymphadenectomy and palpation of para aortic lymph nodes. These are all advanced cases, stage three, stage four, maybe. So you have to do these kind of things. Chemotherapy, the famous chemotherapy is all stages except 1A where just ovaryotomy is good enough. BEP, bleomycin, etoposide, cisplatin. Yesterday I was also mentioning about this. Cisplatin, platin, all ovarian cancers will have platin based. So you can't forget platin. Bleomycin and etoposide are the ones in three to four cycles. And others are EP and EC. Advanced stages, preservation of fertility, because you're doing only unilateral ovaryotomy, even in stage two or maybe three. Side effects, fibrosis of lungs because of bleomycin. Actually, I wanted to tell this story in the next uh, tumor that is yolk sac tumor. I had operated long back, one of our own students, and uh, she was from Malaysia, and um, she had a yolk sac tumor, and we operated on that. She was reluctant initially. She said, uh, why operation for me? She didn't even know that she had a big cyst. She thought she just had a urinary tract infection, and she went somewhere, and they just treated her for that. And we, I insisted on 
an ultrasound and we found that and I just did uh, uh, alpha fetoprotein was 11,000. We operated and then we gave her BP regime. She had very bad fibrosis. Then we had to give her steroids and all that. To cut the story short, it was just 15 years ago. She got married afterwards. She has got two kids. Till today, I'm in touch with her. Recurrence is possible. If there is recurrence, 75% occur within first year, like any other cancer. Yesterday, again, I was telling GTN within first year. Most common site is peritoneal cavity, retroperitoneal nodes. Treatment is not, if she has not received BEP earlier, start BEP. If she has received BEP earlier, paclitaxel and wind blasting can be considered. Radiotherapy is effective, but results in loss of fertility. You will be knocking down the ovaries. You have to refer to oncofertility. First, preserve her eggs or ovaries and then give this. Prognosis, stage 1A, 95% is a good result. In advanced diseases with chemo, 85 to 90% again. With radiation, 65 to 85%. Features associated with high tendency to recur are lesions more than 10 to 15 centimeters. They have the chance of recurrence. Age less than 20 years, somehow they are got robust cancer and they may recur. Numerous mitosis, anaplasia, medullary pattern on histology. So pathologists will tell you, this particular case is such a very bad situation, numerous mitosis, anaplasia, and watch for recurrence. So pregnancy and dysterminoma may coexist as it occurs in young patients. Stage 1A, tumor to be removed. Pregnancy can be allowed to continue. Preferable surgery is in the second trimester. Advanced stages depends upon gestation. If it is towards the delivery time, maybe you can do a section and then simultaneously do the uh, removal of the tumor. Chemotherapy can be given in second and third trimester in the same dosage as for non-pregnant without apparent detriment to the fetus. But however, we hesitate to do that. So summary of dysterminoma, most common malignant germ cell tumor in young, rapidly growing, mostly unilateral. Majority are stage 1A at diagnosis, 95% of them. Unilateral ovariotomy is all that is required, plus minus BP is the first choice in younger ones. 1A, that is also not required. THBSO plus BP for advanced disease in elderly, chemo or radiotherapy for recurrence, generally has good prognosis in stage 1A. Now I turn to the yolk sac tumor, the story which I told you about the Malaysian student. Endodermal sinus tumor, the other name of it. Epidemiologically, third most common malignant germ cell tumor. 15% of all germ cell tumors. The dysterminoma was 30%. This is half of it. Seen in second and third decade of life, the typical one, the student was 20 year old and bilateral in less than 5%, again, thankfully, so that we can save the other ovary. Gross pathology, five to 15 centimeters, somewhat like the dysterminoma, it is large, encapsulated, like, again, fibroid uterus, smooth external surface, mixed solid and cystic honeycombed appearance, and high capsular taste due to rapid growth. Luckily, it was not ruptured in that particular girl. Histologically, of course, this is uh, the pathologist's job. We will simply believe them when they say it is a sac tumor. Clinical features, rapidly growing tumors. This also, she was just thinking she's having urinary tract infection recurrent, but she didn't realize that she was harboring a big tumor. Asymptomatic in 25%. Mass, pressure symptoms, same as dysterminoma. What is this tumor marker? Now comes the most important thing. Here, AFP is the marker. AFP is the marker because it is you know, yolk sac means it has gone up to the level of fetus and alpha fetoprotein is the marker. Lactic dehydrogenase, lactic dehydrogenase is also a marker, LDH. Ultrasound wise, unilateral enhancing mixed solid and cystic mass with a hemorrhagic portion. Solid components have heterogeneous ecogenicity and cystic spaces are divided by septa, as you can see there. What is the treatment? Again, of course, in early stage and young patient, unilateral ovariotomy. That's exactly what we did. Metastatic in young, unilateral ovariotomy again, chemotherapy. 
Aren't you feeling deja vu phenomena? It's the same slide, almost looking like same slide as this germinal one. BP, again, the same thing. BP, bleomycin etoposides is platinum. Three to four cycles. In fact, she didn't even take fourth cycle. She refused to take fourth cycle. With the third cycle itself, she had very bad fibrosis. Prognosis, stage 1A, 90%. I told you all the, the story. She's doing very well in Australia right now, actually, I heard when I heard from her last, having two kids and doing very well. Overall, 70% prognosis, survival rate. Immature teratoma, epidemiologically, second most common malignancy. So which is the first one? This germinoma. Second is this one. Third one is yolk sac tumor. 20% of all germ cell tumors, you can say that 30%, 15%, 20%, or 15, 20, 30, whatever you say, accounts for 30% of deaths due to ovarian carcinoma. Remember this. Peaks between 15 to 19 years in very young girls, 70% in stage one, luckily again. Marker is AFP and LDH plus minus. So gross pathology looks like that. These are the immature cells larger than mature and solid, which has got poor prognosis. Ultrasound shows again heterogeneous solid mass, scattered small irregular calcifications throughout the tumor. Whereas in mature cystic teratomas, they are typically coarse and tooth-like and located in the mural noodle or cyst wall. What's the treatment? Early stage again, unilateral ovariotomy, metastatic ovariotomy chemotherapy, same, 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 same thing. BEP or VBP, wind pristine instead of etoposide. Survival in first stage is 75%, overall 60%. Now I come to the most common favorite undergraduate specimen, mature teratoma, dermoid cyst. You all know this. There are teeth there, there are hair, there is everything, ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. Most common benign tumor, this is benign. Peak incidence is 20 to 40, typically in the reproductive age group, the one which is seen most commonly during pregnancy, the one which undergoes torsion because of the long pedicle, five to 10% of all ovarian. So they're all distributed themselves. 10% is dermoid cyst, 15% is the yolk sac tumor, 20% is mature teratomas, and 30% is this germinoma. Unilocular, smooth surface, bilateral in 15%, Seldom more than 15 centimeters. I have seen very big ones. Cells from all three layers, endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm. Dermoid cyst will usually have an embryonic node there. As you can see, inner surface is called embryonic node. Malignant change can occur. And if it is turning malignant, it is epidermoid carcinoma in only one to 2%, thankfully. Sarcomatous changes can, uh, can also occur because it has got cells from the mesoderm. Thyroid tissue dominance can be seen, which is called struma ovary. Management diagnosis is by ultrasound. Even a blind person can diagnose this. That's what I always say. You look for cartilage. You look for teeth. Earlier, we used to do x-ray, but now with high resolution, we can. there is no need to do x-ray. Commonly seen in pregnancy, can undergo torsion, as I told you, because it is lighter, comes into the center, long pedicle, it is carried away by the pregnancy to the abdominal cavity and there it can nicely turn. Cystectomy is the answer. You don't have to do ovariotomy also. If you are very good without spilling anything, laparoscopic cystectomy, also, cystectomy is also possible. You can do it in an endo bag. Unilateral ovariotomy is not a bad idea also. You can do that, but there is no need to do bilateral ovariotomy. So, I will summarize whole of germ cell tumors, 10 to 20% of all ovarian tumors because 70 to 80% is epithelial tumors. Malignant germ cell tumors are rare, luckily 2.6% of all ovarian malignancies. Typical manifestation is in adolescence, under the age of 10, years, 85% is malignancy. Younger the patient, more is the malignancy. 95% of them are benign cystic teratomas. Again, we are lucky. Tumor markers, dysgerminoma, no AFP, no fetus there. It can be beta-HCG plus minus or LDH. Yolk sac tumor, 
green plus, that is AFP is always there. Beta HCG is negative, LDH can be plus. Immature teratoma, AFP plus minus, LDH plus minus. Mixed germs, tumors, AFP plus minus, LDH plus minus. Chorea carstoma, obviously beta HCG, green plus, LDH plus minus. Embryonal carcinoma, all are plus minus. Polyembryoma, AFP plus minus, beta HCG plus, LDH negative. Spread as epithelial ovarian tumors by, it can be by you know, lymph nodes, blood, and even direct spread, but are more likely to involve regional lymph nodes. Almost always unilateral, luckily, chemosensitive, highly fertility sparing surgery is the standard of care, just ovarian, ovariotomy, unilateral as far as possible, followed by BEP regime chemotherapy. That is the germ cell tumors for you. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Tomorrow we will come up with uh, another uh, class, whatever you want, you can ask me. Thank you very much for your participation on a Sunday evening. Thank you, Dr. Savitri Ramesh, you are showing me thumbs up.